Good morning everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday service and if this is your first time with us a special warm welcome. Let me tell you what's coming up in today's service. Uh, Dave Forgan and Peter Goodyear are bringing us our Bible readings today. Uh, my colleague Linda Bedford is going to be preaching for us and Carol Hutchings is going to be leading our prayers and then I'll be linking everything together with our favourite hymns and songs for you to join in with. So hope you'll encounter the Lord as we worship and enjoy your time with us today. So let's start with that rundown of what's happening this weekend. Uh, we've got an eight o'clock service in Hanley Castle. Uh, there's a service at Ripple and Upton at half past nine and then at Earl's Croom and Welland at 11 o'clock. Do note that earlier start time in Ripple and we've moved it back to half past nine so that there's more time for refreshments and fellowship after the service. Uh, then on Thursday, um, it's midweek communion at 10 o'clock at Hanley Swan Church. Everybody's invited to that. And then next Sunday, the 15th of August, we've got breakfast church in Upton at half past nine. Uh, there's a service in Hanley Swan at half past nine as well. And the Hook and Hill Club at that time too. And then at 11 o'clock, there's a special one-off service of morning worship and baptism at Hanley Castle. You can find details of all those services and indeed everything else that's going on at the moment on our website, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar and also on our weekly newsletter. Now, in a moment, we're going to sing our opening hymn. But first, why don't I remind you about our online collection? We're enormously grateful for all of the giving that goes on in our churches through the envelope scheme and through standard order and direct debit giving. Uh, if you aren't currently giving to our churches, it would be a real blessing to us if you were able to support our work. As you can imagine, during these tricky COVID times, our income is substantially down and we are being stretched financially in all of our parishes. If you're able to give a special one-off gift or give, commit to giving regularly a small amount, that would be a huge blessing to us. You can set all that up via our online giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving. Uh, you can either do it electronically through that or you could ring one of our treasurers. You'll find their details on that page as well and they'll talk you through how to set things up. We really value your support at this time. Thank you. Shall we quieten our hearts? And let's join together with these words on the screen. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Would you pray with me? Blessed are you, creator of all. To you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation. May we rejoice in this day you have made. As we wake refreshed from the depths of sleep, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Let's turn those blessings into praise then. We're going to stand, if you feel able, and sing our opening hymn, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above.
do take a seat. And why don't we continue in our worship of our awesome holy God by just taking a moment of quiet to reflect upon our week. And then we're going to turn back to him in sorrow for our failings and trusting in his wonderful and never changing grace offered to us through Jesus Christ. We say together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to say Psalm 90 together now. It was a prayer written by Moses, possibly in the aftermath of the death of his sister Miriam. I'll read the odd verses. Why don't you respond by joining in with the even verses? So then Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or the earth and the world were formed from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, which passes like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it's dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid at your wrathful indignation. You have set our misdeeds before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are threescore years and ten, or if our strength endures, even fourscore. Yet the sum of them is but labour and sorrow, for they soon pass away and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath and your indignation like those who fear you? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Turn again, O Lord, how long will you delay? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us with your loving kindness in the morning, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Give us gladness for the days you have afflicted us and for the years in which we have seen adversity. Show your servants your works and let your glory be over their children. May the gracious favour of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper our handiwork. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, Amen. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, our eternal refuge, teach us to live with the knowledge of our death and to rejoice in the promise of your glory revealed to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now here's Dave Forgan with our first Bible reading. Our first reading is taken from St Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 4, beginning at the 25th verse. Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for that, Dave. There's so much there in that passage that's challenging. Why don't we prayerfully invite the Lord to go on speaking to us as we praise him again by standing, if we feel able, and singing, Speak, O Lord.
do take a seat. In a moment, Linda's going to be preaching for us, but first, here's Peter Goodyear with our Gospel reading. Our reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. Once the crowd realised that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works of God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Sundays at this time of year are always called the Sundays in Ordinary Time, presumably because they fall between the Easter season and the beginning of Advent. I must say the term ordinary rather defeats me because it seems to me anything but. In fact, we learn more about the extraordinary life of Jesus, his teaching and healing, and of course, his miracles. The passage from this Gospel of John that we've heard today has been preceded by an account that has been all about the feeding of the 5,000, followed by Jesus walking on the water towards the boat of his disciples. Not very ordinary things to me, and nor to his disciples, I guess. Putting it into context then, this particular passage we've heard today follows on from those two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus walking on the water towards his friend in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Two miracles. Two of the miracles that John has chosen as signs to record in his Gospel. John, our Gospel writer, has of course from the beginning set out to show his readers just exactly who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God. And even towards the end of his book, John says something like this, there are many things Jesus said and did which are not recorded in his book, but the ones that are recorded are so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They're called signs, and there are seven of them, these miracles, including the ones I've just referred to, and which some of you may indeed have heard about last week. This feeding of 5,000 people from five barley loaves and two fish must have caused Jesus not only the compassion that he's known for, but also, I think, a reminder of those temptations in the desert turning stones into bread, remember. I think Jesus constantly struggled with these temptations all his life. And of course, the Bible does 
relate that the devil did depart from Jesus in the desert until another time. I'm sure this was one of those times how Jesus must have struggled. So Jesus here attempts to evade this crowd that he's just fed with the five loaves and two fishes. They sought to make him a king, sought to take him by force, John says, to make him a king. So he evades them by going away on his own while his friends head for the familiar territory of the waters. Of course, Jesus eventually joins them in the boat, crossing the Sea of Galilee, which is when they see him walking on the water. Both of these incidents are selected by John. They're signs of Jesus' control over the elements and also signs of God's abundant generosity to those who have trust and faith in him and signs, of course, of Jesus' identity, the Messiah, the Son of God. So here we have in this passage Jesus arriving on the other side of the, the sea only to find that the boats have been following him full of this crowd and they're waiting there to greet him. They must have overtaken him somehow and got there first, I think. I wonder what was in that bread. Anyhow, there they are waiting for him and determined not to let him go this time. So Jesus steps off the boat to find a sort of committee. And what follows is a kind of very revealing, really, question and answer session between Jesus and the crowd. John often describes encounters between people and Jesus, either crowds or individually. And it's through these encounters that John attempts to interpret Jesus' teachings and the meanings behind them. Unsurprisingly, the topic here is food. Unsurprising too that the crowd following Jesus should be seeking more miracles from him, especially those involving bread. Given what they've witnessed already, it's perfectly possible that they hope never to be hungry again. Jesus could keep on producing bread. But they were miffed because Jesus had tried to slip away without them. Now we have no knowledge about who these people were in the crowd. Were they without work as they had time? Were they desperate? Suffering from hunger, not knowing whether they could afford the next meal or not for them and their families. Because Jesus doesn't appear to be angry, but rather seeks through debate with them to persuade them to look beyond the next meal, to look for the meaning. But most really don't want to know, do they? And I guess in one sense we can understand it. They want free bread and they want it now. Show us another miracle, they cry, and we may be persuaded to believe you. A repeat performance, please, Jesus. Whatever he had, they wanted more of it, and they wanted it now. Manna, they told Jesus, was what Moses gave our fathers in the wilderness. They completely overlooked God's teaching through this manna at the time. Only take what you need, God had told them. Don't hoard the manna, leave some for others. Indeed, it, we're told that if the manna was hoarded, it didn't last. In fact, it exuded an awful smell. So anybody hoarding manna, their neighbours would have known about it, presumably. So they failed these people in, in the crowd questioning Jesus. They failed to heed the lessons of the manna. Only take what you need. But this crowd avoid any lessons. For them, all they want to do is focus on the, on the spectacular miracles that Jesus could perform. Just a little bit of an aside. If you read the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which is in all four Gospels, actually, so it must have been very well known at the times of the early Christians, Jesus lifted the food and gave thanks to God for the food. Although it was only a little and 5,000, he still gave thanks to God for the food. You see this in many societies today, especially poorer societies. 
they really give thanks to God for the food. They don't turn their noses up at half of it and throw it away. Back to our topic. Human beings have a physical and a spiritual nature and both need feeding. And it doesn't really take much reflection to see where our own society is in all this. Not least in the way that sin and selfishness darken our understanding and twist logic so that people are deceived and start to believe that evil is good and vice versa. It all gets very mixed up, even inside the church itself. It's easy to carry off those without the maturity to spot the flaws. All this, of course, needs faith. And Jesus challenges these people to see through the physical loaves to the true bread beyond the bread that feeds the soul, the bread that feeds the spirit. Jesus is not just concerned here with the spiritual, but he invites them and us to trust him, the word made flesh, to taste in him the bread of life that bread of life which goes beyond the instant gratification of hunger pangs, the bread of life that is everlasting. And that way to find heaven and earth united in the promised kingdom. But to find salvation isn't all about receiving, it requires giving too, and hard work. I'm amazed at some of our Olympic athletes and the difficulties that they have overcome in order to get to the Olympics and gain their medals. Broken collarbones and ankles and all sorts of other things. Pitting themselves against the odds in their absolute determination to reach that goal. Instant gratification is what these people surrounding Jesus wanted. Babies demand instant gratification, but as they grow and mature and come to terms with the world, that changes, we hope. <laughs> but I think we're very immature still, particularly these days. We live in an age of instant gratification. It seems to me we're a bit like those children of Israel wandering in the desert of instant reward. And it doesn't do us much good. It doesn't do us any good. And whatever we are persuaded to buy in order to make us happy, it doesn't last. A bit like manna, it doesn't keep and it doesn't have any meaning. And while our brothers and sisters starve, we turn our noses up and throw stuff away. Never satisfied, always seeking. Our society itself encourages us to seek for our well-being bread that doesn't last, or things that don't last. A new fridge or a new car makes you a better man or whatever. You know the things that uh, persuade us in adverts. What Jesus was attempting to put across to these followers of his was that he, I am Yahweh, I am the bread of life, the bread that always lasts, that feeds the spirit as well as the body. And we're all part of God's family. He is the bread of life. By feeding on him, we can all flourish and grow together. Sadly then, as now, many turned away. They didn't want the commitment. They didn't want all that went with salvation. Because salvation does require commitment. The hunger that Jesus satisfies for the purpose and meaning beyond ourselves, wakens in us hunger for other things, the things that Jesus would have us hunger for, peace and justice, love, and the desire to walk humbly with our God. It's hard sometimes, but the only way for true joy and satisfaction. Lord, give us this bread always. Amen. Well, thank you for that, Linda. There's really only one hymn we could follow a sermon on Jesus, the bread of life with, isn't there? So why don't we stand and if you feel able, sing along with Bread of Heaven.
And let's remain standing as we declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, do please take a seat and now here's Carol Hutchings to lead us in prayer. Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies our hunger and sustains us on our journey to heaven. Let us pray to the God who loves us, knows our needs and provides for us. As the travelling people of God, we pray for a deepening hunger for the things of God and a loosening of our grip on all the wants and expectations which prevent us from moving towards God's way. Feed us, Father, with the bread of life. We pray for the leaders of the world, that they may make decisions that help all of their peoples. As brothers and sisters with the whole of creation, we pray for respect and reverence among people, regardless of wealth or status for responsible sharing of resources and consideration for the natural world of our fragile and beautiful planet. Feed us, Father, with the bread of life. We give thanks that we have no famines or people dying of starvation here but we ask for your help for the many who are suffering around the world. As we prepare and eat our food each day, we pray for those who grow and manufacture it, distribute it and sell it, shop for it and cook it, and for those with whom we share food. Build us up with your spiritual feeding, which sustains us forever. Feed us, Father, with the bread of life. We bring to you, Lord, all those who are unwell, those who are on our prayer sheet, and those that we know and hold in our hearts. As we ask for daily bread, we pray for those who are physically starving for all who hunger emotionally or try to survive on spiritual junk food, for those who mistrust God's feeding. Feed us, Father, with the bread of life. We remember those who have died in the past few days. We think of their families and their friends. We think of the terrible death of many families who will be mourning those that have died in water accidents and pray that that doesn't happen again this weekend. As we remember with love those who have journeyed through physical death, we pray that nourished by the bread of life, they may travel on eagles' wings into the brightness of eternal life. Feed us, Father, with the bread of life. As we come out of COVID, we give thanks that through this past 18 months, you, Lord, 
have stood beside us. As we grow increasingly aware of our spiritual hunger, we give thanks for the wonder of God's feeding throughout our many days. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to continue in prayer as we pray the Church's special prayer for today. And why don't you join in with me as we pray this out loud. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And gathering all our prayers and praises into one, why don't we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, we've been thinking today partially about God's generosity and kindness to us. So why don't we finish with a great hymn of praise and thanks. Why don't you stand for this if you feel able and sing, Thine be the glory. Thanks for joining us in worship today. Do please invite others to join us as we worship online week by week and do be encouraging one another to return to our in-person services as well. 
it's safe to gather together now. If this is your first time worshipping with us, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. And if there's any way we can help you in your spiritual journey during these unusual times, do please get in touch with me, Barry, at hopechurchfamily.org. We long for the day when we can all gather together again. But in the meantime, stay safe and stay prayerful. And so may the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, why don't we finish with the words of the grace? <laughs> May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.